Yo, and hello, welcome, what's up? It's Vinny Potestivo, and welcome to the very first episode ever of I Have a Podcast. When I first sat down to record episodes about sustainable creativity, the last thing I was prepared for was the intense emotional journey that I would be going on. I had no clue how powerful actually recording podcast episodes is. I'm about three dozen episodes deep so far. This is going to be my very first episode, but I have already interviewed um, about three dozen friends and colleagues and creatives that I can't wait to tell you about. It's all about sustainability. It's all about having a balance. It's all about managing my tools and my skill set and connecting opportunities with actionable strategies and creating content that matches those strategies. And whether you are an influencer or a television executive, a producer, or a dentist, a doctor, or someone who just has to make content for a living, this podcast is for you because I want to help you make great decisions, not just the specific creative ones that appear in video, but really understanding how to approach making content is a powerful tool to have in your belt if you're looking to have a career in content for a very long time. And speaking of long time, a long time ago, when I first got my start at MTV in the late 90s, I had the brilliant opportunity to work with Suchin Pak, who is my first podcast guest here on I Have a Podcast. We chatted about a lot of things, the highs, the lows, the reason why she never returned back to television, and the reason why podcasting is a brilliant platform for her to be able to share her strengths, and I'll let her explain those to you. But it really is all about people. And I can't believe the amazing people I've had a chance to work with. And I am so thankful for that. And I, I can't wait for you to meet them all. And with that being said, let's go meet Su Jin Pak. If you look back at our time at MTV and you look at where you are now, would you say that this is exactly where you thought you would be? First off, you're the reason why I was at MTV, right? You're oh, the one you're the reason put- I stayed. <laughs> people like you, talent like you, for sure. Are you kidding? We had good times. You and I. We, I mean, it's true. Man, who did you share your office with for a really long time with? My first office I shared with Rod for many, many years. That's how he got me in my office. What a boss move, by the way. He literally is a person who discovered you. I got to do the audition and like that piece. One day you were on my schedule and I was like, Rod, that's the girl. That's from, oh, I just saw Jamie Lynn Sigler on her show. And that's the girl I was talking about. That's the one. He's like, we'll make it happen. We really want to hire. And I went downstairs. I was so excited. I was so prepared, actually. You were one of the first talent where I was like, I'm going to make this happen. I see it. I want it. I had that. I I felt that energy from the second you walked in. I I didn't know who you were. I didn't know the story, you know, about in terms of like where you were in your career. But it's that energy we both brought to it, which I think now is interesting as you share with me of like, for you, it was like, oh, I'm going to make this happen. For me, I was so nervous until you walked in and I felt like, oh, this person isn't who I'm auditioning for, but I'm auditioning with. And there was, it that completely took all that nervous energy I had. And then I could just nail the reading of a prompter, which is what I do for a living. <laughs> well, we made you um, write it back then too. So we, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, both. And, you know, you look back on any career and um, there's all those flags that like, Along the way, you're like, right, that was that marker, and then that was that person, Mm -hmm. and that marker. And, you know, some people I have no idea where they are, but I can credit to so much of my life. I mean, you and I have kept touch over the years, but I do remember that moment so very clearly. When I met you, I was full on Connie Chung time. You know what I mean? I was going to do this job. I was going to go from here to a network news. I was going to sit behind an anchor desk. I was going to eventually end up on national news. That was the job that I had had in Yeah, my you mind. pictured it. You like manifested it. You saw it. Yes, manifested it. But to be fair, it was the only picture, only version of journalism that I was ever shown. And when I got to MTV, you know, people don't realize this, right? Now it's funny they're doing like that real world the first episode over again. I mean, that had never happened before. When I got to MTV, I tell people about the diary series. Up until that point, you didn't have journalists carrying their own cameras and videotaping themselves. For us, doing the news was a personal experience and a personal way of storytelling. I had never thought 
that me as a person, as Asian, as female, as young, any of that mattered in the storytelling until I got to MTV and I realized that that could be and should be for me part of the storytelling. I never thought that my experience as an Asian American female was part of the storytelling. I was always looking at the way that news journalists were, would be you get a piece of paper, you do an interview, you know, you have no point of view, you're just there to like deliver the news. And at MTV, it wasn't that. It was who I was was part of the story. And to me, that felt like such a more honest and fun way of being a journalist. And so being at MTV really changed the way that I view journalism and really what I call storytelling. You know, just stories that matter. You interviewed a ton of people. Are there conversations that resonate during that time? Or is it all popped culture? <laughs> Vinny. I mean, I get asked this question, and every time I get asked this question, I am, I need to actually come up with an answer. One of the things I think about, and tell me if you agree or disagree, mm -hmm. is not necessarily in the interview, but in the way that Jay-Z was who he was, meaning that he really controlled the narrative of his story and what was allowed in the interview space in a respectful way. And he's, he was difficult in so many ways and very inaccessible. I always remember that his interviews came with a different It was energy. a more strategic. There was a, a real strategy. That's right. It was like you were, you were, you, he was going to respect you mm -hmm. and answer your questions, but you were also going to respect mm -hmm. him. And I think that there was uh, that I, I, I always sort of like respected and appreciated. But I don't know. I mean, we were, I was interviewing, you know, celebrities and music stars and they were all young I don't know that 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 was um that was a big part of my experience there also Finney remember like I never grew up with MTV remember so being at MTV was the first time that I ever really even saw MTV so I didn't grow up with like this notion of like celebrity cultures even even being a journalist yeah. and understanding that I think in some ways that really helped me in my career I think is, is that I really wasn't in it for all of that. I just miss running down to the studio. Ten, you miss running down to the, you don't miss running down to the studio every 10 to the hour. I do. I can miss it now. Um, and also you were there for one of my biggest audition moments ever in my entire life, by the way. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out what would have brought me, you and Greg Baldwin, to go to The Weakest Link. Do you remember? But me and Greg Baldwin, we went to this hotel to audition for and wait, what was it? You what was the answer that you gave? Oh, I know. Well, <laughs> I had was it was. It? It's called a divine answer. I just purple. I. It's purple. <laughs> I, said purple. I dug deep into my soul and said, "Lord, give me just one word that I can say out loud because I have no." I, <laughs> and you said purple. <laughs> I answered the purple, and <laughs> that was a fun moment. <laughs> what? For years, every time we would see each other, we'd be like purple. purple? And there was, I remember there was like, this almost like a head tilty kind of like, so the question, yeah, like the, I'm pretending like I don't know this, by the way, um, like this isn't like etched in my skin. Uh, we played. Uh, I, I know what the question was. I remember, remember now. What was it? The question is, what is a group of witches? Yes. And the answer is coven. That's, that's and you an said, answer. <laughs> I went with you said. Purple purple <laughs> it just kind of like came i was I, but you know i was just kind of feeling it I, the whole room laughed though every greg baldwin was like i knew i knew you got it right at that moment i knew you were going to get on that show that was a fun moment i'm so glad you were there with me on that little aha moment of my my energy <laughs> there's a tight there's a there is i mean for a lot of like you said just kind of growing pains of that place. There was that tight crew of people when we were there. And I always have to remind people that like when we left around about the time that we left is when MTV stopped being the version of MTV. Do you know what I mean? It's not like I left and then even TRL was on. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Or that even 10 to the hour, we weren't doing that for a long time, you know, 
by the time I left, the writing was on the wall that like times were changing and it was, it's just different. It's the era of social media. Like, Weird to say, we, they didn't know what one of my favorite yeah. moments at MTV was after we left was getting to come back to the TRL goodbye show and, and seeing Benj and Joel and like, just like the kid, yeah. us, the kid, like the kids, yeah. <laughs> kids are here. <laughs> yeah. It was just a moment in time that was just that time and it no longer existed. When I actually left. sometimes get a little sad talking about stories because I, I hate dis dispelling any like myths or like revealing the, un the bad things that were happening. But to be honest, a lot of the bad things that were happening were loud and change happened or like there wasn't too much that happened. I don't want to say politically because it's, it's obviously a corporate setting. Like what you saw on MTV is kind of like what was happening live. The mess ups, the, all the good stuff, all the bad stuff. It's crazy to think of a time where we didn't control our own narrative. Like to us, social media allows such control over our own story in a way that it impacts our own reality. I, the, the same way reality TV did 20 years ago and still does today. And when I think back to early unscripted TV programming, there's one show that comes to mind that paved the way for many, many other reality shows to come. Lessons learned, getting comfortable with pushing yourself out of your comfort zone is definitely the best way to grow as a creator. If you start feeling uncomfortable and you start feeling like you need to push yourself out of your comfort zone, well, that feels like a good indicator that you're going in the right direction. But I'll let Sujin translate that. And while at MTV, you created My Life Translated. Mm -hmm. My Life Translate. Get it translated, you know, because I'm Asian. I have to translate my Asianness. To MTV's credit, like, listen, we got a lot of things wrong, um, but we tried. But we tried. We, tried. we tried. really did. We really did. And I, I agree. I think part of it was because we were the center of youth culture. And that's what growing up is, right? It's just trying and like yeah. miserably failing, but like that's youth culture is in the effort and the growing. And so, you know, um, that show kind of evolved from conversations with producers and executives. And I really wasn't at first really keen on doing a show like that and certainly not on bringing cameras into my home. Yeah. Um, that had to, that, that took a while for me to get comfortable with. And I never, I don't think I ever was comfortable with it. I think we did maybe six episodes and then I was done. And once I left MTV, I had the experience of going to a network news place and doing the whole thing. You know, I had that offer and I couldn't do it. And then it just took a left turn from there. And I've never been on any <laughs> quote unquote right path or path I saw when I first met you. Like nothing has been the same ever since I left MTV because I just couldn't fit what I wanted into a typical newscaster box anymore after being there. There was no, there was no going back to like sitting behind a news desk. Yeah, like literally. That was, it, that, it, that did, me, it never that happened. Me, yeah, that was the last never, time. It never, yeah, that was it for me. So, um, so I've been, you know, trying to figure out ways in all of the creative projects I do to come back to that, that experience, which is the, the experience of being able to speak as a complete, the totality of who I am. If there's one thing I've learned from Su Jin and her career, it's don't be afraid to take a risk. Especially as a creator, trust is a gut feeling that strengthens over time. And there's a risk of doing projects with people you know really well, and there's a risk of doing projects with people you don't. So I ask, what are you really risking? How did, how did it start? Add to cart. Yeah. So Add to Cart, the podcast, which is fairly new, um, started with myself and my co-host, Cool Op. And as we were talking about, you know, Cool Op and I knew each other because we were organizers in the activist space, in the Asian American Pacific Islander space. We had this organization called A+, which is within Time's Up. So it's the AAPI women's group within the Time's Up larger organization. We had known each other through that work, which is so different. <laughs> right? Than doing a podcast. And so um, when she approached me, 
while there was, I knew like her energy and I knew a version of her. I didn't know one single thing about her outside of us planning, you know, events and like, you know, talking about Asian American women in the workplace. She was like, that's what we talk about. Like, that's what we know. Yeah, that's what we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in our meetings, granted, we were always goofing off and laughing. Like we were the ones oh, no, that really? were in the back. They were like, guys. <laughs> so I, you know what I mean? I knew that. Like, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the wise asses, you know. And so I think we both got a sense that, you know, we knew each other um, in that way. And, and there was some hesitation. But like I said, you know, there's always a risk when you're doing something creative, you know, who your partners are. And, and you live and die by that choice. You really do. I think anyone who started a business, anyone who started a creative project that then has to bring on a partner, because every creative project eventually has to leave your brain and go out into the world, you have to assess like the risk. And there's a risk of doing projects with people that you really, really know well, and that could go badly. And then there's a risk of someone maybe you don't know as well, and that also could go badly. So I figured, you know what, it's a risk either way. This one felt more comfortable to me. I also knew that she shared a passion for something that was so intrinsically centered in my own value system. Like that's important, right? Like you, you can have just like hold three things that for you are immovable objects, you know? And for me, it was being an Asian American female in entertainment in the media, you know, and then it goes on and on. And she aligned with all of that. So when we decided to do this podcast, funny enough and ironically enough, I said, dude, I do not want to talk about race, politics, ethnicity. I want to talk about stupid shit that we do all day and that is mostly shopping. <laughs> and so we both landed on that and we thought, okay, that'd be really fun. Add to cart is about the things that we buy, the things that we buy into. So it could be shows and movies and books that then reflect on who we are as people. And naturally and organically, to nobody's surprise, like all of our episodes are about Asian American identity as women. You know, and you're like, fuck, I really didn't want a podcast about this. And yet here I am. Um, but for me, it's just the most authentic conversation about that. Like I didn't want to be a journalist reporting on that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I do that, I've done that. That just felt too heavy. Um, but again, I, it's just funny that most of our episodes are me crying about, <laughs> you know, trauma and my marriage, well, and, that's, you know, creativity. You've got this new role that you play now in media that's fun for me to get to watch yeah. too as like a mom and as a wife. Like, I, you know, yeah. for, for yeah. many of us who grew up here in the States watching you in the early 2000s, you know, we know what you brought to, you know, we knew exactly what your point of view is. Yeah. This is a really fun way in, and I'm kind of jealous everyone gets the side of you. This is like the real Sujin Pak. So do you hear yourself being your mom? No, because, oh dear God, I hope I'm not turning into my mother. God bless <laughs> Is that her. the secret root of like um, what you were afraid of, of this becoming or? <laughs> no, you know, I, I have turned into, and I didn't know that this was in me, the Asian auntie. It's the auntie that we all have that that older woman at the table that's a little too drunk that's a little too honest you know what i mean that'll tell you exactly how it is so i didn't know that that was the role that that is so naturally to me and you ask like is it am i my mother you know for me being a child of immigrants i'm my mother to a degree but my mother is so far from who i am like we don't even share a language you know so in that respect it's physically metaphysically impossible for me to be my mother but i can be the asian auntie that like my mother has friends like me you know what i mean that like i see at church and blah 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 it's like oh look at you your fa your face it's so big you know or oh why are you wa walking like that or you know like that shirt you wore it was so cold in that room did you feel it was so cold because the shirt was so small you know and so i'm that friend of my mom's that was the Asian auntie that was always around. Um, and it's just been really fun to like embrace, like you said, my age, where I am in life, my kids, my the fullness of my life, which 
was it something that I shared or even wanted to share when I was at MTV very much? You know, I've never, ever really been this personally open with my life and about my point of view about things. And so um, it's been really, really fun and, and scary and it's exhausting. And um, I often don't want to record. Yeah. Um, but then you do and then, you know, and then it's, it's great. And then you crawl back into bed and then you have to do it again the next And, you know, it's, it's the creative process, I think. Well, and it's okay. I, I want to say it's okay. And you know this, and I'm sure you've talked to people about this. The creative process is often very painful. And that's okay. I think when we set up expectations of even what the process should be, it makes it more difficult than it is. I, I realize that, like, my hesitancy, my fear, all of that, my nervousness about this particular project is part of what feeds the project. So I'm okay with that, you know? But that's, that's what we like signed a, up for. A, a natural, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and by the way, it opened a lot of doors. You know, I always said, I never said no to anything. I said yes to everything. And so, I mean, I don't say yes to anything now. Yeah. <laughs> but that's because I had, I put in 20 years of yeses. And now, you know, it's just, uh, it's just different. And but without that, I wouldn't know to do that. You become a people pleaser. Nothing wrong with being a people pleaser in the beginning part of my career. I'm glad that I got to. Yeah. It's so true. The creative process can be painfully rewarding. And with the ups and downs of the industry, burnout is legit. So prioritize. It's hard to know how to prioritize projects and family and opportunities, and especially even yourself. I mean, it requires taking a step back, taking a breath, Accessing the change, like it's 20 years later, Sujin Pak has a full-on family. How did that happen? You have the funniest husband in the entire world, too. You married Literally. a funny guy. Did you? He's a funny man, Mike Bender. <laughs> I mean, his brand. I mean, that is like he truly is that. What a wacky. My kids. What are my kids going to do for a living? What kind of? What a cool. Sort of the hodgepodge medley of, of culture, cultural yes. awareness, now that I'm thinking about this, with what Mike created with Awkward Family Photos. Yeah. Just the idea of knowing yeah. that we all have them, and yeah. um, and we certainly do, and they're all awkward. Yeah. <laughs> and that was always my pitch at MTV. Yeah. Is like It's like the Osbournes, yeah. except everyone's the Osbournes, but no one wants to say it. Do your kids watch YouTube? Are they trying to be YouTubers, journalists? No. Like, no, what are you God, seeing? No. Well, first of all, they're six and eight, so you know they're they're very very young, and we also don't um, you know we don't do a lot of screens. Like that's what most people who work in this business are like. Are you crazy? I'm not putting screens in front of my kid. I know what that does. So there's that. Um, but you know, our family is very, especially Mike. While he does awkward family photos and it's a digital site and blah blah blah, he writes children's books. He's a right like for him, he's a writer first and foremost. And so there's a lot of that happening. Lots of, lots of writing, lots of that sort of thing. This is um, in terms of like recording and, and doing any of this is not something that they've really been exposed to. Like, I don't know that they've ever even seen me on, on TV. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Do they hear you recording your podcast in the other room sometimes? Yeah. But for them, it's just a zoom call. It's interesting too. Yeah, they don't know. Mm -hmm. That's fun. They don't know. Until you real until they're like pretend well, you walk in one day and it's like <laughs> welcome to Act well, to be <laughs> <laughs> like literally. It is gonna be embarrassing when they're a bit older and we're archiving all this and I'm talking about, you know, the type of underwear I wear. You know what I mean? It it'll be embarrassing. And you know what? Such as Welcome life. back. Welcome Such back to media life. switching yeah, talk. Welcome back. Like <laughs> Tell me a story that really matters. Okay, move along. Exactly. Yeah, it's okay. You'll get over it. How do you protect yourself throughout the creative process? What are some things that you've learned? Some have you learned tricks, yeah. <laughs> or are we still learning them yeah. too? Like, what have you? What What are some things you do to help? I think for me, time management mm -hmm. is really, really. Um, that's like the baseline. So, what does that look like for me? You know, I look at my day, my week, my month or whatever, and I build 
time to be creative on project X, I build time to be creative on project Y, I build time to do nothing, I build time to do an hour of just internet hole diving. I do, do you know what I'm saying? So compartmentalizing my day like that allows me to be very relaxed in the time I've allowed. And then when I move on to something else, I don't, I try really hard not to have any cross, um, cross time. So for me, the, the way that I'm the most creative is when I'm the most structured with my time, which can be a little bit um, counterintuitive. And so for me, from like the minute I get up to like when I have to be with my kids is filled every half hour. I block my time in every half hour. And so I know that when I look at my calendar or post it with my day blocked out to half hours that I'm really taking care of myself and I'm energized and creative when it's empty is when I get real, real funky Yeah, and it's not productive. So to me, time management is a really big part of it. I love that structure. And to be honest, otherwise you get lost in everyone else's energy. Um, and I even just recently myself started putting my, like time for myself to create my own content for social media in my calendar the same way I put exactly. this in it because – That's right. Everything goes on there. So yeah. to have an organized, methodical approach to being creative makes a tremendous amount of sense when it comes to how to be impactful and still – be innovative. Like you have to be completing yeah. to be able to be continuously yeah. creating. I love that. I love that advice. Well, I'm going to copy you on some of my things just so you know I'm working. Yeah. I'm just going to like yeah, do a little tag. Purple. Purple just a little purple up. tag. Purple it up. <laughs> that is too funny, purple. I forgot. That was like the best experience, man. <laughs> I love you so much. That you I are love the best. you too. Yay. You've been listening to I Have a Podcast with Vinny Podestivo. If you like what you heard and you want to hear more, please find us at IHaveAPodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks a lot for listening, and we'll see you next week.